Oh. It's nice to have people cheer. Yeah. I feel like a celebrity. <laughs> um, well, welcome. Uh, let's talk about the developer revolution. What is that? <laughs> so I think we've gone from a, a place where often a lot of decisions of how you would build software at companies, how you would build marketing pages, how you build e-commerce tools, were driven by top leaders sort of going out and picking big monolithic solutions based on marketing. Now we've sort of seen a revolution where all of those tools and all of those uh, solutions tend to be picked bottom up by developers that just start using them, start building with them, uh, and, and, uh, and also require the choice of the best tool for them to actually be able to build the kind of experiences that, uh, that, that we are expecting from uh, digital presences today. Right. I think it's the confluence of there being more developers within the ecosystem, and as Matt was saying, being empowered with budgets. You know, Bessemer, um, where I work, has been investing in developer platforms for well over a decade. And our first investment was Twilio. And at that time, the idea of a, a DevRel team or developer evangelist was, was really radical. And now it's table stakes. Yeah. And that's what's required in order to get a developer tool sp spreading within an organization. You have your advocate who then allows a tool to spread within an organization and grow from there. And at NetFly, you said you've sort of seen this revolution happen firsthand, yeah. right? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what that looked like? Yeah, I mean, so we started Netlify back in 2015 based on an idea of a fundamental architecture in, in how developers would build for the web, it coined the term Jamstack to describe this approach of really completely decoupling the web UI layer from the backend business logic layer and starting to take advantage for like a very big world of APIs and services to handle things like content off e-commerce and so on. Um, and we really built like a bottom up um, a bottom up adoption model for our web cloud platform where by today we've onboarded more than 2.7 million developers and um, have companies across all industries building uh, everything from web apps, e-commerce and uh, and marketing sites on top of our platform. So we've really seen especially this modern front end web developer being empowered to take a lot more decisions than they used to be able to uh, and being empowered to build much better uh, representations of the companies they work for. Because today, almost all of our interactions with different companies and different brands happens through digital channels or happens online, right? Like, so the way you're able to build as a company will decide how most of our, your customers engage with you and, and perceive you. And, and that's been leading really like this revolution in, in front end web developers being the ones that in many ways that drives like how your customers perceive your brand and your business. Right. So in other words, um, the developer revolution isn't just uh, something that software companies need to pay attention to, right? Because every company needs to have a, a digital presence. So how can businesses, how can business leaders uh, make sure that they're empowering their developers to, to make those bottom up decisions? So I think, one, one of the things we've seen is that um, for a long time, a lot of the tools that developers used, especially in large enterprises, were driven by um, salespeople whining and dining key C-level executives in the company. And then they would come and tell their developers, hey, we have this new tool coming down that you have to all use. And I think companies have discovered when, when they buy off the shelf solutions, they are also delivering generic off-the-shelf experiences to the customers, and they fail to differentiate. And we've seen that the customers that really invested in 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 buying the pieces of buying the software that's the same across all organizations, but investing in developers to build the custom experiences that are specific for themselves, have simply had more success in 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 building relations to the customers and building great brands and building great user experiences. And I think a lot of executives have learned that if they come to the develop, developers with a tool and say, you have to use this, the developers start, start, start leaving and start getting frustrated and start trying to work around it. And they get like incredibly bad business results out of it. 
Uh, building on what Matt was saying, I think some of the embracing of a lot of developer tools and developer platforms is effectively encouraging your business to focus on its competitive advantage. Mm. Rather than needing to recreate the wheel for communications or payments or, or anything else that could be simply ingested as an API, let's focus on exactly what makes your business special and great. And when it comes to, to Netlify, for example, front-end web developers, they want to focus on making you know, the best personalized experience Experiences, having the customer front door in their website be what actually moves their business needle, not recreating the wheel. Okay. Um, and so now that there's so much power in the hands of the developers, um, how do we make sure that uh, the other needs of businesses are being met, right? There's compliance concerns. There's legal concerns. Um, it's great, of course, that developers are, are being empowered to use the tools that work best for them. but. Uh, and, may, and uh, as part of that, make key business decisions. But what's the best way to manage developers so that they're not that that the whole needs of the, the business are, are being met? So, so the the power of the um, bottoms up developer for sales play is that you get access to a broad swath of users that that use your tool organically and they sell. Um, pardon me, they share share that. Um, share that tool within an organization. More teams get onboarded onto the platform, but generally, you couple that over time when you have a quorum of users in an organization with a, with a tops-down sale. And it's that magic that actually makes these developer platforms grow and do massive businesses. So you, you definitely aren't going to sacrifice things like security and compliance and the like. And generally, over time, a lot of these developer-first companies will have enterprise features, have security baked in from, uh, from the beginning because they want to grow into the Fortune 100 and not just have the bottoms up user as its core audience. Basically, all, they want to go from SMB and bottoms up all the way to Fortune 100. Yeah, and I think it also comes down to like when you when you empower your developers, you should empower them in the areas where they can make a difference to your business, right? Like in the areas where they can build something that set you apart. And at the same time, you should be wary about developers wanting to build everything themselves instead of buying off the shelf components for the areas where it makes sense, right? Like so I think one of the things we're starting to see with companies like Netlify, but also companies like LaunchDarkly, for example, that are building like feature flagging solutions and so on, is all these best practices around like how do you build and develop and operate software being encoded into developer platforms that gives you a lot of these guarantees out of the box, right? Like when you, when a team adopts the Jamstack model and builds like a decoupled web UI and build it with, with Netlify, they get a lot of, of guarantees out of the box around like our security team being on top of their whole um, online presence, guarantees around being able to roll back to any previous deploy in milliseconds, um, guarantees around release management processes, around instrumentation and observability that, that they would have to go and verify individually and hire security teams to, to be on top of individually if they didn't buy the solution. So I think the more we see the underlying platform and workflow pieces being abstracted away and turned into companies, the more we can expect and push those companies to, to, to be good at privacy, to be good at security, and to be good at reliability, and then let develop, developers really make a difference in terms of building the custom business functionalities that sets a company apart on top of those. Okay. Mary, what about you? What do you think? I mean, I think what Matt said is 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 really well said. But but as I was mentioning before, I also think that you know, the bottoms up model is meant to couple with tops down, and most of these massive companies aren't compromising on security or compliance simply because you know developers are adopting the tool. It's when you can actually couple the tool, and as Matt said, you're not compromising one or the other that these businesses become really big. But uh, universally loved, not only by the developer, but by the person who's making the kind of larger ACV decision. What are some ways these big, old, monolithic companies, um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the ones that are still using Windows XP, um, what are some ways that they can embrace the future and reverse their approach? Yeah, I think, I mean, realistically, no one can go and just trash their monolith and start over from scratch, right? Like it's incredibly important to understand that every large enterprise company will have a lot of software that will essentially stick around for, for decades to come. 
because they, they, they won't be able to do investments to remove it, right? So it's important to look at ways where you can gradually start allowing your developers to embrace this new reality. We focused a lot on, for example, in, in, in the Jamstack architectural approach, it's very possible to start moving, a, like decoupling a part of your application or part of your digital presence on its own, expose the underlying sort of legacy services as, as APIs that you can communicate with and reuse, and then gradually in, extend the service area of, of the new architecture while gradually micro, like gradually chipping away at the monolith, taking little pieces, moving into independent services, replacing with external tools and so on. Because it's never, it's never really an option to just stop the world and build from scratch again. And, and I would never recommend anyone doing that. And as we're talking about how to get institutional stakeholders bought in to a new developer platform, that's a really powerful way is yeah. showing like quick time to value for some component of your, of your business such that you can get that institutional buy-in over time. And, and Netlify does a really wonderful job of doing that. I, how did you get the idea for the Jamstack? There's got to be a story there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in the space of building tools for web developers. I was CTO of a company in Spain uh, where I lived for seven years before moving to San Francisco that built websites for small to medium businesses all over Europe at a very large scale. So we were building 100 websites a week, tens of thousands in total. And I architected the whole platform that all of those sites got, got built with and hosted on. And then I started a, a, a cloud-hosted CMS company in Spain, came to the Bay Area with that, built in, in as multi-tenant CMS in this like monolithic approach. And it was while working on that that I started getting the intuition that if only we could completely chip off the, the web UI layer, turn it onto its own thing, keep it independent from all the backend data access and so on, it would be possible to scale it so much faster, um, distribute it globally, make developers work uh, much faster on that layer in isolation. And then we could really start thinking about like, how do we connect from that to all these different composable services? So that started out like as an early intuition, I built a small prototype of that, put it into the world, saw it resonate with the right people. Then got a co-founder on board that's one of my best friends back from Denmark, convinced him to come join me in San Francisco. And we started really thinking through, okay, if we believe that this architectural approach is better, why are people not doing it right now? What's holding them back? And we sort of found all the reasons that, all the reasons that it was a cumbersome process to start adopting this architectural approach and then said, okay, we're gonna build a platform that takes all of those reasons away and make it incredibly frictionless. And that became the start of Netlify. And it's, it's really interesting when you think about the power of the developer revolution and developer stakeholders is that what started as just a, a small idea or rather yeah. a big idea a few years yeah. ago, there were only 14 million or so Jamstack developers and 2.7 million of them use Netlify. Yeah. Wow. If you think about the power of, of this idea and how it has proliferated through the developer community, like obviously Netlify is a fantastic example, but that's the power of this community. Get it, buying into an idea and then spreading within. What do you think are some of the things coming up in the next five years that um, this developer revolution is going to power? I mean, some of, some of the things that we're thinking a lot about at Netlify is how we go from now that this concept of decoupling the web UI from all these backend business logic services and third party APIs, now that that's been like sort of really become a mainstream developer trend, one of the next points of, of friction in actually adopting that is how much developers have to work on just writing the glue code between that web UI layer and all these different APIs and services. You might spin up a new e-commerce project and you have a service for authentication and you have an API for managing the product catalog and you have an API for actually payments and transaction and orders and so on, right? And developers have to manage authentication and security and figure out like the documentation for each of those services, how to make them work together, how to instrument them for being able to observe what happens if something goes wrong and all of that. And we think there's a huge opportunity to really simplify that layer of the stack and introduce like 
architectural principles of like how can we get one access point to all of those different APIs and services, one way of authentication um, and one way of configuration so developers can focus again on actually building user experiences and not on gluing together a lot of different systems. Right. Now, I want to talk a little bit with the time we have left about no code and low code platforms, yeah. like yeah. Zapier, for example, right? Um, where do you think they fit into all of this? I mean, it, it, obviously, I, th I think they're probably putting power, developer power, right, in the hands of people who aren't traditional yeah. developers. Where do you, what are your projections there? Well, I, I, I think that, you know, one of the things about focusing on your competitive advantage is what you see is that a lot of stellar developer platforms also have, also build in some functionality for business users. Like for example, we were talking about LaunchDarkly, like they have functionality such that product managers can also turn on and off different feature components. So I think that this move towards low code, no code is really normalizing the idea of the citizen developer. And the more people that can participate in development, participate in moving the product forward, I think that that is only going to continue. I don't think that it takes away from the core engineering persona whatsoever, yep. but I definitely think that there is tremendous room for the democratization of development, which is a trend that Bessemer has invested behind. For example, Zapier is one of our companies, but pure engineering platforms is also, they aren't going away. Yeah. I've always been very outspokenly yes code. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and, and I've been hearing as, as long as I've been in the web industry, oh, but all of this is going to be replaced by site builders or by AI for websites or by no code tools and so on. And I think the truth is that we, we see more and more no code tools and that will continue. And it's a great thing, right? Like we want to democratize building for the web as much as we want. We want everybody to be able to contribute. But at the same time, users' expectation to you as a company keeps going up, right? Like we, we, the, the website that you could put out like 10 years ago, uh, if you were a bank or today, is just like two completely different worlds, right? right? And the way you present yourself online and the way people engage with you online is essentially becoming the way you differentiate yourself from other businesses, right? Like, and there's no way that you can just buy other people's no code tooling and go really differentiate, right? Like it'll always limit you to what other people have, or like to the parameters that other people have already set for you, right? And that's why even though we keep, we will keep seeing more and more no code tools and more and more extension of them for all kinds of people to build their presences online, but we'll also keep seeing constant shortage of actual developers and a constant demand for helping those developers do more because that's how you actually stand out in the world today. What do you think um, is the number one thing that um, any business leader should do when it comes to managing specifically developers? I mean, what it, what's one thing that they get wrong that they should be afraid of? I would say including developers in the strategic decision making. Yeah. Because I often find that, you know, and, and it ties back to something we were discussing earlier, but like the tops down approach simply doesn't work. And oftentimes the developer might have a better idea of what to do in a more sustainable yeah. way, making them happier in the business more efficient. So I would say including them in the strategic decision making. Build really close feedback loops with developers. Focus on allowing your development team to iterate quickly um, so you can be a part of the feedback loop um, and use that to be really to to make your developers as customer centric as possible and have them feel real ownership of what your customers experience when they interface with your company. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, I, this is a wonderful conversation, um, and that's all the time we have. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much.